Number one, Jesus was able to do a miracle of mass multiplication, making munchies for the masses. Say that real fast, man. <laughs> Jesus was able to do a miracle of mass multiplication, making munchies, munchies for the masses. See, I can't even say that really fast. But basically what, what, what had happened is uh, Jesus is about to feed this big group of people and, and the opening video that we watched this morning, the young lady that brought the clothes to give to those orphans, there's a similar story to that. God does these miracles that are very... I, I'll tell you, all the miracles in the New Testament, the ones that Jesus does are very natural. And, and they, they deal with some interesting stuff because the fact that these miracles are, are, it's just like, they're not miracles that you can really, how did that happen? That's what you say. It's not like, you know, all of a sudden, you know, Jesus didn't go, boing, 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 pizza. You know, it didn't happen that way. But what happened was, you just keep passing something around, and you never get rid of it. It's just like eating lamb. Have you ever eaten lamb? The more you chew it, the bigger it gets in your mouth. <laughs> it's miracle meat. And you chew it and chew it and chew it, and you just can't get rid of it. But uh, Jesus was doing this miracle just because of the fact that that he had compassion. Whenever Jesus did a miracle, whenever Jesus did something, a lot of times in the New Testament, there's always a preference that says, Jesus was moved by compassion. If you want miracles to abound in your life, I challenge you to do this. Walk in the love and the compassion of God. Because where love is, where compassion is, miracles happen. I watched a guy who, who needed deliverance from some things in his life. And he had a bunch of church people praying for him. And I'd been praying for this guy for a long time. And, uh, and, and, and people would pray for him and pray for him. It just seemed like he couldn't get delivered. And one day we had a prayer meeting and, and he went forward. And, and uh, I was talking to Nicole in the foyer because it was the end of prayer meeting. A few people were still praying. And all of a sudden I heard, Whoa! And this guy was doing laps around the church. He was running around the pews and doing laps. And uh, so I, I finally caught up with him and I said, hey, what's going on? He's like, man, I am so free. I am so free. I'm so delivered. I, I can feel it. I can feel God's presence. I haven't felt it that for a long, long time. He was excited. He was... So I sat down with him afterwards. I said, what made a difference? he said, well, people have been praying and screaming over me for a long time. But he said, tonight, when I was up at the altar, he said, a little old man, and I know that man, his name was Ben. Ben was in his 80s. He said, Ben, put his arm around me. And he said, God, this is your child, and you love him. Lord, just work in his life. And that was a simple prayer that made my friend feel a breakthrough. God works... Through compassion. God works through love. And, and sometimes, sometimes the reason that God does some extraordinary miracles and some amazing things is because God is moved by our compassion. When we lay hands on somebody and we say, in Jesus' name, be healed, hopefully the reason we're doing that isn't because we want them just to be healed or we want to see a miracle, but hopefully we love those people. We want their suffering to be over. We want, we want them to be whole so that they can enjoy the life God's given them. Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. As soon as Jesus heard the news, he left in a boat to a remote area to be alone. But the crowds heard where he was headed, and they followed him on foot from many towns. Oh, those crowds. It's hard to be alone in a crowd. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat, and he had compassion on and he healed their sick. He loved them. That's what compassion is. Compassion is love. And can you imagine God and man 
seeing these people suffering. Because he's not just seeing their suffering, he's feeling their suffering. I'm going to tell you something. Bill Clinton can't feel your pain, but Jesus Christ can. He I feel your pain. That's not true. But Jesus felt compassion for the crowd. He felt that, he felt that need for, for them, just longing. And so, so he moved with compassion, healed their sick. Verse 15, that evening the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place, and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food for themselves. So, when the disciples came to him and said this, what are they thinking? They're thinking, these people are going to get hungry and start rioting, or something's going to go wrong. we got to fix this. They're not thinking about the people. They're thinking about themselves. We can't feed these people. Jesus has a way of pointing that out. Because verse 16, Jesus said, that's not necessary. You feed them. <laughs> Isn't that great? Lord, we're far away from any place and we don't have any food. We need to send these people. Oh, no, 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 that's fine. You guys feed them. Okay, Lord, maybe you didn't hear me. So they said, verse 17, we only have five loaves of bread and two fish. We'll bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass. So everybody sat down. Jesus took the five loaves and the two fish. He looked up to heaven. He blessed them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he gave the bread to the disciples who distributed it to the people. Now, I don't know how that worked. I don't know if he took a big loaf of French bread. <laughs> Probably not French bread. Oh, 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 welcome to the Holy Land. Um, it was probably that like round, cakey bread. But he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. And as they broke it, they just kept breaking it, and giving it, and giving it, and breaking it. And people around them probably, you know, everybody was breaking bread. And, uh, but I imagine as they kept breaking it, the bread didn't diminish. The fish didn't diminish. It says here, in verse 20, they all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. That's a lot of leftovers. 12 baskets of leftovers. Verse 21 says about 5,000 men were fed on that day in addition to all the women and the children. So they called the feed of the 5,000 because there was 5,000 men. But there could have been ten or 15,000 people altogether because they just counted the men. Some of them might have had families that were large. Some of them might have had spouses or, or uh, female companions that had gone with them. So... We, 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 we don't know what the accurate full number is. We just know there's 5,000 men there. But God did a miracle that day. A miracle of multiplication. So number two. God has a way of making something little become something big. And here's the cool thing. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you don't need to have a lot. Because your little can become God's big. What you've got to offer, what you've got to bring, God can anoint that, He can bless that, He can multiply that, and it can reach, for the kingdom of God, it can reach the world if we'll just be willing to give that up. Imagine somebody saying, well, I've got a couple loaves of fish and some bread, but I don't, or a couple loaves of fish, 
Hey, I'm really smart up here. Some more fish comes in a loaf now. It's fish loaf. It's like meat loaf, only fishy. Um, a couple of fish and five loaves of bread. That's better. You might not think that's very much. And, and, and in some eyes, that isn't very much. In the eyes of the people around you, they go, no, that's not very much. But if you offer what you got to God, he can feed thousands of people. Matthew chapter 30, Matthew chapter 13, verses 31 through 32. Here's another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of God is like a mustard seed planted in a field. Oh man, I love mustard slathered all over a corn dog. I'm going to have a corn dog in a moment. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It's the smallest of all seeds, just tiny. Do you guys have any mustard seed in your cabinets? It's just a little, little seed, just a little tiny seed. But it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree or big bush. It just gets big and huge. And the birds come and make their nests in its branches. Jesus is saying faith is like a mustard seed. If you got just a little bit of trust in God, God can make that trust go a long way. God can make that trust go a long way. There's a lot of people just, just trust in God just a little bit. And God does extraordinary things. If you'll, if you'll, if you'll give him that trust today, he'll bring multiplication into your life. He'll take what you have to use and what you have to offer and use it for his glory. So let's look at Matthew chapter 17. Matthew 17 verses 14 through 20. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. A man came and knelt before Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and suffers terribly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. I want to explain this. There was a demonic force in this kid that would cause him to have seizures when he was in an area that could do him harm. That's why he would get seizures by the water or by the fire, because that force was trying to drown him or burn him. And so, so this, this gentleman, if you had a child that was having seizures by dangerous places, you'd be just as concerned. Well, first he brought the child to Jesus' disciples. In verse 16 it says, So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not heal him. They could not heal him. Jesus replied, You faithless and corrupt people, how long must I be with you? How long must I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. Then Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy, and it left him. From that moment, the boy was well. Which is really cool, because he could water ski again. the fire. Afterward, the disciples asked Jesus privately, Hey Lord, why couldn't we cast out that demon? You don't have enough faith, Jesus said. I tell you the truth, if you have faith even as small as a mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. Here's the disconnect. And I believe, I believe this is something that we all struggle with. A lot of us believe that God can work through other people. And a lot of us believe that Jesus can do anything. That's great. But not all of us believe that God can do extraordinary things through us. And a lot of times, instead of manifesting faith, we manifest excuses. A lot of times somebody says, hey, would you pray for me? 
and we go, oh, 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 I'll, yeah, I can pray for you, but you should really call a pastor and have him pray for you. Or you should come to the church sometime and let him pray. Let me tell you something. If you got the Holy Spirit dwelling on the inside, you got everything you need. You can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. A lot of times we have that disconnect. And I believe the disciples were uncomfortable. Like, my son is doing this, my, and they're like, well, we know Jesus can heal him. Well, could you guys pray for him? Demon be gone. How's he doing? Oh, he's throwing himself into the fire. <laughs> Bring him back up here. <coughs> Seven sons of Sceva. Prominent Jewish rabbi. They decided that they were going to go and cast out demons. But they didn't have a relationship with Jesus. And they didn't believe the teachings of Paul. But they knew that Paul was important and they knew that demons had left in Jesus' name. So they gathered around the demoniac and they said, In the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, we bind you and cast you out. The demon looked up at them and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then he ripped all their clothes off. And they ran out of the house. I don't know if they were in their underwear or if it was worse than that. But let me tell you something, it was humiliating. <coughs> See, we need to have faith. We need to have faith that God can work through us. That all things are possible, not just for other people, but all things are possible to them that love the Lord. We all love the Lord. God can, God can work all things together for good if we trust in Him. And one of the things we need to do is we need to put our trust and faith in Him. We need to realize that God is for us. God is for us. The Bible says, if God be for us, who can be against us? When Jesus caught the woman in the act of, well, He didn't catch her in the act of adultery. She got thrown before Him because the Pharisees found her in the act of adultery. And I don't know what they were doing peeking through the windows anyway, but when Jesus... When Jesus looked at this woman, he asked her a question. He says, who condemns you? And she said, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. See, one of the biggest things that the enemy has in Christians' lives is this. He tells us all the time, you can't do that. And he uses, he uses our failures and brings them to our attention as excuses. Let me, let me tell you what day somebody in your life is going to need prayer. It's going to be on a day that you're doing rotten. You're going to mess up. You might fall into temptation. and you might, you might be having a really bad day. And you might go, oh God, I feel so far away from you. I really need you. And somebody's going to walk up and go, hey, can you pray for me? And right now, there's a, there's a war in your mind because you're going, oh, uh, I, uh... Nanny's going, you can't pray for that person. You know what you did this morning? Do you know how you treated your husband? Do you know what you said to your kids? You're a sinner! <laughs> he does that. And we start going, well, I, uh... uh and people look at us and wonder, going... Hey, wait a minute, this person's really bold, usually. And now they're stammering and stuttering when I ask them to pray. What we have to do is we have to, we have to walk in, in the victory. We have to have enough faith to trust that Jesus took care of our sins 2,000 years ago on the cross. And that we can walk in faith. And we can lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Let me tell you something. God uses me once in a while to do things that are pretty cool. But not because of who I am, in spite of who I am. 
God will use you too. In spite of who you are. If you, if you go back through history and you look at some of the people that God used in incredible ways uh, and you study their personal lives, you'll find out that some of them were incredibly flawed. Some of them had struggles, and the enemy used those struggles against them. But we're more than overcomers through Christ Jesus. And we don't have to be laid low in, 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 the, in the area of faith. We can trust in God, and God will show up. We can say, mountain be moved, and that mountain will move. So number three, if you want God to do the extraordinary in your life, you only have to release your faith and give up your lunch. <laughs> I didn't say lose your lunch. <laughs> you just have to release your faith and give up your lunch. Sometimes, you know, one of the biggest struggles, and I'm going I'm to say this just <clears throat> bold faced and out there because one of the biggest struggles that we deal with in Christianity is insecurity. And a lot of times we think church people are mean. Sometimes we run in church people and we think, man, they're just backbiters and complainers and finger pointers. And a lot of times we think, oh, that person just mean and honorary and vicious. And, and the truth is, that's not really the heart of that person. That person's incredibly insecure. They feel inadequate. They feel like they don't measure up. They're afraid that if they get real with you, you're going to castigate them. Which means set them aside and not want anything to do. And, and, and the truth is, a lot, of our, a lot of our quarrels, our arguments, church struggles come from insecurity. It's just because we're not walking in the, in the way that God wants us to walk. And so instead of, instead of just walking in the way that God wants us to walk, putting our faith in Him, we start to go, well, what about so-and-so? What about this? What about that? And sometimes we'll put ourselves down before anybody else does because we just know they're going to put us down. And that's insecurity. That tears believers apart. Let God use your lunch. Don't let insecurity eat your lunch. Because sometimes insecurity will take the little bit that you have and it'll destroy. Because you're worried about losing that little thing instead of giving it up to God and letting Him make a big deal about it. So there's a lot of people walking around going, oh, you can't have this. This is my half-eaten lunch. I've got two fish, and I've got a loaf of bread left because I ate four of them. But you can't have it because it's not much, and it's all I've got, and I've got to hold on to this lunch. And, and God said, hey, give it up. Give it up because at the end, I'll give you 12 baskets full of that stuff. Trust me. And a lot of times we withhold because of that insecurity. That, oh, I don't think I can do this. We're afraid. We're afraid to release our little to the Father. Just like the, the man with all the talents went and multiplied his talents, and the guy with the next set of talents, the man who'd been given one, he went and buried it in his backyard. And when the king returned... He dug it up and brought it to him and said, Hero King, I know, you're, I know you're a hard task master and you demand much of us. I buried this and now I can give it back to you. <laughs> he was happy. And the king looked at him and said, what's this? You could have at least put it in the bank and got some interest. I'm banishing you. What? But I, I, saved, you, I saved you coins. Oh yeah, take that coin away from him and give it to the next guy. Because he had no faith in the king and he had no faith in himself. Insecurity will destroy the little you have instead of multiply it for the kingdom. Matthew chapter 10, verse 37 through 39. Jesus said, if you love your father or mother more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you love your son or daughter more than you love me, you're not worthy of being mine. If you refuse to take up your cross and follow me, you're not worthy of being mine. 
If you cling to your life, you'll lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll find it. So many of us are clinging to our lives. We're clinging to the, the things we have. Or we think, oh, I've just got a little, so I'm going to hold on to it. I'm not going to let that go. I really got to fight for this. I really have to have this. I really have to... And God is saying, don't worry about that. God has the wealth of heaven. All the riches of glory. He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added on to you. With God, every time you let go of something, your hand is full of something else. Do you understand that? With God, every time you empty your plate onto somebody else's plate, and you take it back, your plate's fuller than it was before you emptied. With God, every time you do something and you trust Him and you give Him that little that you've got, He returns it in big ways. You can't out-bless Him. You can't out-give Him. You can't out-do Him. He's the King of the universe, the Master of Heaven. The storehouses and riches of all the universe are in His command. That's a good Father to have. That's a good father to have. We need to have that mentality that, that God is going to bless our faith. If you grew up in the home of a millionaire and you were a playboy, you probably wouldn't care much about anything you do. Oh, shoot, I wrecked my car. Oh, well, Papa will give me another one. Oh, did I do that? Oh, my dad will pay for it. It's okay. See, you wouldn't worry about that because you knew that your dad had this incredible wealth. But some of us, sometimes, we, we kind of get a spirit of poverty on us. A spirit of lack where we go, oh, I just don't think God can help me through this. I just don't, I don't know, I just don't, I don't think he's going to show up, I don't think he's going to, come expecting God to do something, manifest your faith, God always rewards faith, trust in him, do you need to feed a crowd on a budget, well you don't have to worry about that, because God doesn't have a budget, he's not limited, by human capacity. He's not limited by our mental capacity. He's not limited by anything. He's the God of the universe. So let's bow our heads. Close our eyes. This morning I got two questions to ask you real quick. And I'm not going to embarrass anybody. I just want to pray with you. But you know God, God wants to do great things in your life. Um, listen, right now, I want to speak to a couple people thinking in their minds right now that the best is coming on. I believe this is what the Lord is saying to you. Stop that. The best is yet to come. Your life isn't over. It's not going to be robbed. Don't allow disease to come in and rob you. Don't allow... The enemy to come in and steal the happiness that could be in your mind if you just trust in God. Just like Jesus turned the water into wine and it was taken to the master's ceremonies, he was amazed that that was the best wine they'd served. God has something for you. God's not done with you. Your life is not over yet. God has a plan and a purpose and he will get the glory if you'll just give it to him. Just give it to him. But the second thing I want to deal with is there's some people here that may have some issues with insecurity. Maybe you don't feel qualified or maybe you don't feel like what you're doing is making a difference or maybe you just, maybe you're scared. 
You got some fear in you. Right now, in Jesus' name, I just bind the enemy from planting those things in your mind. Trust in God. Trust in God. If you've got just the faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. So don't worry about moving mountains. Worry about getting that mustard seed. Worry about trusting in Him. Begin to shut off that flow of negative thoughts. Begin to shut off that negative mind frame that makes you feel that insecurity. Just begin to do things in the kingdom. Don't let the enemy rob you. Even if your meal's small and happy, go ahead and share it. Because God will use it. Let's say this prayer together. Father God, we come before you today. We are your servants. Take what we have. No matter how small, and use it for your glory. Help us not to limit what you can do. Show up, Father, and work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.